and welcome everyone. This is the Voices of Neurodiversity here on the Neurodiversity Media Network. I'm very excited about this. Let me see. Is, are these better frames? Yeah, these feel like slightly better frames. And Mina is here as well. Great. So everybody can introduce themselves. I'll start with our oldest arrivals so our newcomers can get settled. I'm very excited. Y'all, it's going to be an easy conversation. So let's go forth. Miss Jessica Jacks, tell us about yourself. Hey, uh, so I am a writer and creative futurist. I'm currently working on a speculative, speculative science fiction uh, trilogy at this point, discussing many of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. And you're using ChatGPT to assist in the creation of that novel. It is my creative companion. I'm using it to both generate um, prompts that will help me in my writing, um, as well as organizing my character bios, my outline, my plot, all the good stuff. All right. Veronica Yans, hello. Hello, everyone. So I am a founder and CEO of an operations consulting business. And so we basically tell people we whip business backends into shape so that when they dial in their internal and revenue operations, they can be fully prepared to handle the rapid growth and expansion that they feel when they go like 50x, like say tomorrow. So we love butt stuff over here. <laughs> And thank you for setting the tenor of our conversation today, because I really want it to be light and informal. We're here to have a good time. We're here to talk about ideas. I want it to be fun. All right. As she said earlier, old in internet dog years, Miss Lacey Box. That's right. Um, I've been around a long ass time on these internet streets. Um, yeah, I run the content direction agency. I am a content marketer. I call myself also a content strategist uh, because we don't do any content marketing without the strategy behind it. And I have been playing with AI writing tools since they first started coming out when they were laughably bad. And now they're much, much better. Um, and so I can bring that uh, how to use this in your business and marketing voice as well. And I'm also using it to help me um, with a novel, Jessica, so. Amazing. And Brittany Budd taught a fabulous course last week about how to use ChatGPT. It was great. It was so good. Thank you. Um, so tell us your perspective and how you came to it. Uh, with respect to ChatGPT or just like in life? <laughs> <laughs> with respect to chat gpt or at least ai in general yeah so i'm Brittany bud i call myself the content queen i've been doing mindset and business coaching for three years now and pretty pretty recently kind of made the pivot into content strategy um similarly to lacy and i i you know these things are going to keep happening. And, you know, we kind of have this resistance at first, like, oh, shit, like, I don't want to be out of a job here. And so when this chat GPT kind of started to getting a little bit of buzz, I thought, okay, I need to like dig into this so I can be honest about my thoughts. And I was like, oh, this is such an amazing tool, such an amazing resource. So yeah, last week I held a class teaching people how to use it for their business, to come up with content, to come up with years worth of content, to pair it with Canva, to make graphics in bulk for you, which is so much fun. It's a game changer if you know how to use it. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes. And that knowing how to use it part is important, and we will definitely get to that. Yeah. Mina Raver, the futurist among us, delighted. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've already been talking a lot today. I'm sure you can't imagine. I'm the founder of the 2K Days Project. That's an international initiative for justice-conscious business leaders creating the social structures of the future. I am a social futurist, which means that I am very, very particular 
about building the social and civil structures that are going to make sure that our technology enhances us, not replaces us. So I'm really excited to be here talking about ChatGPT and how we can use it and not be replaced by it. Okay, y'all, this is gonna be fun. I wanna start with, I think, some general thoughts about how usage is going to take our jobs. Okay, because that's what we're hearing, right? Like when people are talking about this, when the media talks about this, it is very mm, overwhelming, overbearing. It's going to change the world. And I think everyone here has used it enough to be able to say that that's true, but not in the way that people are talking about it. This is not Skynet. I, we're, we're ways away, y'all. I mean, so far away. What structurally is do you think is going to change the most? And we'll just kind of ping pong around and I'll hit you all for every question is how we're going to do that. So let's start this one with Brittany. What is going to change the most with this software? Um, well, right now we know that it's behind by over a year. So I think that once it's mm, once it's caught up with how smart we are and what's going on, I think that's going to be a huge game changer. And like we already know, when I talked about this in my class, like Google owns the most human-like robot. So I don't think that ChatGPT is too far off from becoming more human-like. And like we can we can get it to do different things. Like I had it, I had to create me like a script for a reel. And I was like, make it sound like a Taylor Swift song. And it was like, okay. And like my email list got an email today and I was like, make me a workbook, but make it sound like Alexis Rose from Schitt's Creek. And it was like, okay. And it did it. And it did an amazing job. And so I think that it's only going to keep getting better and smarter. And as you know, on entrepreneurs and content creators, we have to, we have to play this game. This is one of these things where we have to play this game. And if we're not learning the new technology and learning the new tools, we're going to get left behind. I don't know if you guys saw the article that came out there yesterday or today, but it said that ChatGPT passed a master's level business exam at, at a college in the, in the States. Like that's a big deal. That goes to show how much knowledge it has, which, you know, we know it's pulling from the internet, which has answers to absolutely everything. But as as content creators who are who are trying to build and not be replaced we need to be able to use this as a resource and as the tool that it can be while keeping ourselves at the forefront of our businesses because that's what we are you know we're kind of the face of our company and that's the most important thing so as it keeps getting smarter we have to be able to so veronica when you first came to me you said i'm using it and I feel weird about it. Yeah. And I've come to love it a lot as a tool. And no, and I'm just being completely transparent because what else is there to be? I was weird about it because one of my core values in life and at Business Laid Bare is integrity, right? So it's like, how do we use a tool like this that is so capable of doing such amazing things, but in a way that aligns with your ethics? So that was something that I was learning and it's something that I'm testing from the lens of operations strategists. Like our clients come to Business Late Bear and they're like, oh, well, this onboarding process or whatever we're doing is really, really manual or really, really clunky and inefficient. So I start putting information into ChatGPT, for instance, and I'm just like pretending to be a client and the information that they're asking that our clients cannot give is quantitative data. And so when all I have is qualitative data, like, oh, it's taking me five steps, or 
I just don't like how long it's taking me to do this or whatnot. ChatGPT couldn't answer anything. They're like, we need data sets to match this. So I'm just like, oh, so there still requires a human nuance element to this because listening to the interviews, because we believe that successful operations begins with people, it's like, this cannot replace people, at least for the work that we do and the and the problems that we solve. So it's helped me understand where chat GBT falls into the spectrum of our work and our life. And tools are just the tip, like apps of the iceberg. So it's like without the strategy, without the intent, without your core values being set, you, I don't think can unlock it fully, at least in my opinion, to what you wanted to use it for in the best way. That was a really long <laughs> answer to integrity no. matters and ethics matters. And I Perfect. finally found it. <laughs> Lacey, what do you think? Does this structurally change? I mean, you're a copywriter. So yep. is chat GPT coming for your job? So the, the short answer is no. The longer answer is I think a lot of people are going to try to use it that way and they're going to be disappointed. Um, now, are there ways to get it to do amazing things? Absolutely, 100%. Not disagreeing with any of that. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of um, drawbacks that I still see. Um, and so I'll, I'll just name a couple of them just off the top of my head. The first one is that, like, as Brittany mentioned, like, an AI by definition is learning from stuff that already exists. So if you are asking it for derivative content, whether that is derivative of like, here, I'm giving you a data set, please summarize this and help me out, or write me a blog post about something that it can essentially go Google, <laughs> um, it's derivative, right? Like there is, there's no original thought happening, which is fine. In a lot of cases, that's all you need, but like, um, there, there are drawbacks to that. So like in the work I do as a copywriter, especially for brands, like they always want an original voice. They want an original take on things they want. And none of that is going to be generated by an AI that by definition is remixing things that already exist. Now we could get into like, I'm literally remixing things that already exist as a human being as well, but I have a little more capacity perhaps than the AI, at least I would hope. The second thing there is that, um, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, but like AI is notorious at this point by the fact that who's you have to look at who's programming it and what is the data set it's learning from. And whatever biases are already in that are going to be reflected in what it's turning out. So that's something I want to see. And I bet Mina will have more to say about this, but that's something I want to see absolutely more um, transparency and clarity around because that's where we get into really bad problems. Like there, a lot of people talked about when that Lensa app was really popular for a few minutes <laughs> about how the, the images, you would upload a picture of yourself and they would be thinner, lighter skinned, uh, more Caucasian looking. Like I had that myself. I'm a larger person and most of the avatars that generated for me were thinner than I am in real life, right? So like, that's a thing. It's a bias because that's what it's learned. It's not that the AI is <laughs> fat phobic. It's just learned that from the data set that it, and it, it's learned fat phobia from the data set it was presented with, right? So that's a second one that really bothers me. And the third thing that I think is maybe make sure that my job, at least for the minute, is super safe is that I'm already seeing my colleagues um, putting language in their contracts that says, the output you receive from us will be 100% human generated, not AI I'm generated. I'm so glad you brought this up because I saw you <laughs> talking about this. And this is key. There are already high level copywriters who are saying we're not using chat GPT in the final product of the copy that you are paying for. And that's not going to hurt that's fascinating. them. fascinating. Right. No. I think it's actually going to like my prediction is that at least in the shorter term, like maybe the next, I don't know, one to five years, it's actually going to put a premium on human generated, <laughs> uh, human written copy. And Jessica and I already had a conversation briefly about this and that it's kind of a weird place to be that we're saying like 
human generated copy. But I had this conversation with my team. I, I have uh, four writers under me in our in our agency. And we had this conversation because we're all talking about it internally too. Like, ooh, I tried this and it worked. Ooh, I asked it to summarize this transcript of a client call and it was really helpful, right? And so we're still feeling out the edges of what's appropriate and what's where does that line, and there is no bright white line, right? Except I think, and this is my opinion, having it completely right, for example, a blog post for my clients would be disingenuous for me. Like if they're paying me or my team to write something, we should be doing the writing, not feeding a, a, a prompt to chat GPT. If you're paying somebody to do that, great, but be, you know, do that, like say that's what you're doing. On the other hand, where is that bright white line between what we do and how we use that tool as Veronica was talking about? You know, it's like, this is a tool. It is gonna make some of our work easier. It's gonna make some of our lives easier, but we have to find internally, what is that line and how are we gonna describe it to our clients and put it in our legal contracts and things like that. So that's sort of what we're at, but I don't believe it's coming from my job right this minute, although people will try it. <laughs> And Mina, we get to the really important questions of integrity and honor and how we integrate this tool, which is an, an important thing to note here, highly accessible. I know people who are using ChatGPT to do things that they could not have done before. So we're, we're, I don't think anybody here would advocate for it to go away ever. And you can't close this Pandora's box once it's been opened anyway. But the accessibility portion matters. How we take that and help it to go forward matters. So what does that look like, Mina, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to how people are going to find themselves out of work? So for a very, very long time, we've been on this trajectory of making labor more and more obsolete. And I'm down with that. But relationships will absolutely never be obsolete. When we're talking about integrity and we're talking about honor, we're talking about how we feel when we are with another human being. And we will absolutely, I mean, just based on what I know about how human beings evolve to work with things, we will absolutely get to the point where we don't care about what's written. What we care about and what our writing will be charged with is the process of getting something done. So, Again, yeah, absolutely, the labor of writing will become obsolete. The relationship of creating content, the value of being known, being seen for your business, for your work and everything else is not something that a, any form of AI will ever be able to replace because it's mostly chemical. You're, I th you're either muted. I don't know why I can't hear you. That was me, which brings us to an inter interesting intersection, I think, with the art in particular, right? Artists have been very opposed to Mid Journey, to Dolly, to those particular AIs which scrape things and generate work that they themselves are not generating. Why do you think there is more resistance there than there is in, say, writing and copy. It feels like a different argument, even though structurally, fundamentally, it's the same conversation. You asking me? Because art is protest. Art is activism. Art is expression. And computers must not take these things over for us and therefore can't. It's one thing to go and have a pretty portrait of yourself made. You're not soul connected to it. It is a completely different thing to figure out how to visually or musically express those things that make us so human. It's a completely different experience seeing something and having that move through you. AI won't be able to replace that. It won't be able to explain it. No, there's a theory called the uncanny valley, and it shows up in art and in filmmaking. 
what we're talking about is a sense of realism that when we look at a piece, we can tell that it's not quite right. I've been talking about this for years on the podcast because especially the early aughts uh, children's movies, The Incredibles comes to mind in particular. We talked about the Uncanny Valley a lot because those people don't look like people. They're computer generated, but they changed the art style significantly between The Incredibles and The Incredibles 2 because people did not like the way The Incredibles looked in that first film. When you look at mid-journey now, there are problems. Fingers are a big one, right? But it's also, the, a thing that struck me a lot is that when you ask it to generate kitchens, there's a lot of little appliances on the counters, but it doesn't know what they are. It can't tell that that's a coffee maker and that's a toaster, right? It, it doesn't know what those things are for. So. When we're saying that AI can duplicate but not create, that's really important. Jessica, I think this is where you, I think you've done the most work with having it attempt to produce something creative. And you've had problems. Um, I have had a couple of problems as far as um, mid-journey is concerned. If we're, if we're specifically talking about using mid-journey as a storyboarding um, tool, and me and Lacey had a brief conversation about this too, where it doesn't get things exactly right. It will um, do a lot of kind of like, um, as we said kind of stereotypical appropriating as far as the way that we want our characters to look. Um, it requires a lot more um, finagling, so to speak, as far as getting the prompt exactly right to uh, showcase exactly what we want. Um, but all in all, let's kind of backtrack a little bit. You guys said a lot of brilliant things, I think, um, as far as um, how ChatGBT is neither um, obsolete or going to completely replace us as content creators, as writers, as, um, you know, as artists. And my whole take on that is essentially that, you know, things like ChatGBT, for instance, is only as efficient as the user. Um, if you're not using it appropriately, you're probably going to lose faith in it a lot quicker and you're probably just going to move on from there. Um, people like me and like Lacey and, and you guys who actually use ChatGPT in a way where we are challenging it, we are teaching it, we are training it exactly how we think and what we're thinking about. Um, and the beauty of it is that it is only within a single thread that you get the most out of it. Now, if you if you go on different threads for different projects, that's also really good because it allows it to focus on things. If you are compiling a whole bunch of information within one thread, it will get stuff wrong, even if you tried super, super hard to get things right. Um, so it's not perfect. But you have to remember also that right now, ChatGPT isn't actually searching for answers. It already has the answers. And I think that's the problem um, that people are kind of not not exactly highlighting in their minds is that once it can search, it's going to be something other than what it is right now. It's going to be more <laughs> is really all I can say, the short and sweet of it. Agreed. And the bias that is implicit in it now isn't always going to be there. It's going to be something else. We'll, we'll talk about some of the potential ramifications of that. But first, I want to talk about the bias. One of the clearest examples for me is when you ask ChatGPT its position on nuclear power. And I had a really long conversation about this the other day with Marisa Lowen who is Canadian and could not understand how Americans dislike nuclear power. Like this is a very political stance here in the States and the bias that is implicit here in chat GPT is obvious. There's been obviously 
outrage from various political factions who are talking about what's wrong with the bias. But this one is the clearest and most distinct to me because outside of the United States, many civilized industrialized nations have gone all in on nuclear power, France and Canada among them. So when chat GPT has clear bias against nuclear power, that's because it was given to it by its American training materials. What does the bias mean? Let's start with Veronica. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? My internet just cut out. It always does, right when you're asking. Oh, it's just like, right? great, you just called my name. <laughs> right. What does the bias mean? What do we have to be aware of when it comes to implicit bias in the AI? Yeah, absolutely. So when we were testing this out in terms of, again, like the only way that I really test out yet chat GBT right now as is as an operations strategist for our clients and also as a founder, how I can make things a little bit faster. And I noticed that when I type in just point blank, really general conversational things or things that I needed to answer versus when I'm very specific as to, I need this to be much more human. The answers are very different. Like it always defaults to the most generic thing. It always defaults to where do you find, where is it easy? Like you said, for Google to find the most information and that bias, I didn't even think about it until I was like, okay, write me a one paragraph example for why businesses should care about operations. And then I then added more context to it and you could see how it changes from academic to persuasive to conversational, depending on what you need. And that bias, if you're not careful, you might be using it and telling people information that's not helpful to anybody because it's too generic. And you can change its mind. I bet Brittany has experience totally. with this. I have I, done that too. I, I have. I called it out. <laughs> I right. named her Rosie. And I was like, I don't think that's right. That's not a good definition of efficiency. And she's like, you're right. It sounds too negative and not in the sense of how you were trying to write it, which is a call out to the content creators here. Like you all would know this without me having to correct you. Yeah. Yeah, I, you're exactly right. It is 100% bias. I am in Canada and my husband works at a nuclear power plant. So I know all about the bias <laughs> that we're, we're running up against. But, you know, in speaking with its limitations and its bias, you know, I am a very spicy kind of person and not in like a sexy kind of spicy, but in like, I want to say bad words. And one of the things that it will not do for me is swear. It's, it keeps telling me you can't curse. It's going to turn people off. They won't buy from you. You you need to be more professional. And I'm like, no, fuck that. Give me some bad words. Um, but absolutely, you know, I as you said, as it continues to grow, and we know that the CEO has, you know, his sights set on charging for this at some point. And I think that that point is probably going to come faster than we think. I heard $42 same... today, which... Did you? Yes. It's... The number is obviously an homage to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. $42. And it's... On if you are interested in the nuance of this thing, it's happening in their Discord. There's a lot of discussion about the price and how that is. $42 seems fine to me. I'm an entrepreneur. That's just a piece of software, right? But for a lot of people, it becomes now totally inaccessible. And Mina, I think you probably have opinions about that. I absolutely have opinions about that. Um, when we're looking at things like that, like like this specifically, some of the ways that people have talked about using them who aren't entrepreneurs for meal planning, for content planning, for homeschooling, for their kids. And so we're seeing these discrepancies in uh, ideation, the bias, and all of these things. It becomes very, very clear 
that we can't use this even for mundane decisions, but then also pricing labor class out of it, right? If you're working minimum wage, you're sitting here on one side terrified that this is going to take your job and on the other side pissed as hell because now you can't use it to take up some of your homework so that you can spend more time for your fa with your family. So ultimately, instead of creating more social stability, we are sandwiching an already very stressed out, sy systemically stressed out portion of our population, which means we're not getting from them what we absolutely need most, which is their peace. So we have more access to their creativity. And the emotional labor piece is a big deal. I have had multiple conversations with assistant about meal planning, about recipes, about structure and schedule and how to create, right? I've asked it for help with homeschool. Really all of those things I've absolutely asked it for. And when we remove the access to that, we really are truly penalizing people for not being who we want them to be. And then therefore increasing the stratification. When we talk about what that looks like, Jessica, do you have feelings on the soft skills, the emotional output, what has it been able to generate for you in terms of creativity or ease? So I'm definitely convinced so far that ChatGPT is one bias, just slightly backtracking to the to that question. Um, it loves high school level fan fiction. Um, if you start writing with, with it in the beginning, that's all you're going to get until you start actually training it, um, you know, what exactly you want out of it, which emotion is definitely a big part of that emotion, um, your beliefs, your perspectives, your and those perspectives of your characters as well. Um, but um, in regards to the soft skills that you would need to really like get the best out of ChatGPT. Honestly, how you interact with AI, it says a whole lot about how you interact with people. It does. You don't speak to it, you know, like if you don't want it to feel like a machine, don't speak to it like a machine. If you don't want it to feel apart from you, don't speak to it like it's apart from you. Have an actual conversation with it. I was watching Ex Machina yesterday and there was a moment in the very beginning where um, this AI named Ava, she was like <sighs> trying to have a conversation with the guy, but she was like, how uh, do you want to be friends with me? And he's like, yes. So how are we going to make this work? If it's a one-sided conversation where you're asking me questions and I don't get to ask you questions. And that is not a foundation of friendship is what Ava said. And I believe we should go with what Ava said. If you're not actually trying to establish a relationship or a deeper understanding of these tools, then it has to be as exclusive, unfortunately, as they're trying to make it be. That's part of my belief. Lacey, have you seen the work that's been done around training chat gpt to mirror uh inner dialogue conversations where people have fed it journals childhood mm -hmm. journals as an attempt to have a conversation with their past self yeah. yes i have actually mm -hmm. what do you think is the upshot of that, right? Because this has been really interesting for me to read. Some of those conversations are deeply personal, deeply sensitive. When you train that one thread to be your younger self, 
and then have a conversation with your younger self, we're giving it our emotions, right? I feel like this is a really fascinating experiment to me. And so, you know, kudos to the people who took the time to do it. And they're a lot braver than I am because I would not feed that personal information to <laughs> this beast <laughs> at this point. Um, there's not enough transparency. There's not enough privacy. I don't know where that's going. I don't know who has access to it. It feels, especially when you're in your own um, window and you're in your own thread, it feels very private and it's not. Um, and so I would be very, I don't know what the therapeutic value of that is. Maybe there is some. I would, I would be very hesitant to say like, oh, everybody should try this without the benefit of a therapist to lead them through it or somebody who's been trained. But um, I do think it's fascinating. I think too, though, that it's still just regurgitation. So like, essentially, it's a very high powered tool. It's like, it's like, you remember those word bubbles that were really popular for a while, like in the late 90s, early aughts, you could feed it in a story and it would make a word bubble. This is an advanced word bubble. You know what I'm saying? All it's doing is looking at those journal entries and saying, you talk a lot about feeling sad. I was sad now. You know what I mean? Like there, it's not, it might be useful in certain circumstances for like picking up patterns, but that's essentially what it's doing is pattern recognition, right? Um, at a very high level. And so while yes, maybe in some therapeutic thing that could be very useful, I am, ooh, <laughs> I would not try it with my own personal journals anytime soon. The other thing I wanted to point out is that like right now, um, we were talking about bias and, and, and how it's being fed. It, it's also being limited to or Brittany said, it wouldn't let her swear. <laughs> um, it's also being limited because there are bad actors out there, right? And so like, yes. um, I, I was playing with Mid Journey and when you, when you start with Mid Journey as, a, as a, a trial user, you're in a Discord server and you can see what everybody else is asking for, right? Um, and you can see the results. And I put in, um, inspired by something Jessica posted, I put in a, a paragraph or two from my novel with a description of a setting. And um, it kept spitting it back saying, this is against our terms of service, you can't do this. And I was like, what, what am I? And I finally, finally figured out, I had used the word wound, something was wound around something and it was reading it as wound and you're not allowed to um, ask it to portray wounds. And so when I took that one word out, it was, but at the same time, oh, I just saw my video go away. Can you all see me? You're still here. Okay. Um, at the same time, I'm watching this feed go by of what other people are asking for. And you can see their requests as well as what the AI has generated. And there was somebody that was asking for over and over again, um, anorexic 12-year-old girl, very beautiful in red uh, skin tight leather outfit. And I'm like, none of those words are triggering this thing to think it's bad. And yet all of those words together, I immediately know why you're asking for that. You know what I'm I saying? Was, and, yes. I was trying to generate for my graphic for this, a ball of yarn and it hit me for balls. It would not let me use the word ball of yarn, <laughs> I, which, it, again, addresses the fundamental flaw because a skein of yarn is not a ball of yarn, but we're tagging specific words as bad rather than concepts. And so, believe me, humans are clever. Right. And we are going to find ways around those, you know, that, that whoever that I'm going to, I'm going to generalize here and say that was a dude putting in that request for an anorexic 12 year old girl. Um, we are going to, we He's found a way around it already, already. The other thing I want to bring up, Briar, I'm not sure, are you familiar with WordTune and the latest update they have put out? I Called know Spices, I think. the software, but no, say more. Give okay. Us the, so like I have not played with it personally. I read about it. Um, but uh, WordTune is an app kind of like Jarvis or even Grammarly a little bit, but um, it's specifically for writing. It's specifically for writing uh business type stuff 
they've out they've put out an update and what i've read about it is that there are now um different little modules you can add to the update where it will pull out sources that are fact checked with links it'll pull out historical quotes that are fact checked it'll pull out um all this other information and so the thing i was reading was this guy started out like with your super generic chat gpt prompt or you like write me a blog post about i don't know efficiency i'm going to borrow veronica's example and it of course spat out something very generic at first but then he's like okay put in a quote okay put in some sources okay and then all of a sudden he had a pretty decent i'm not going to say it was like the best written thing but a blog post with sources and quotes and and information that was act that's actually been vetted right whereas <laughs> chat gpt quite hilariously makes shit up <laughs> All um, the time it makes all the shit time. up and makes it seem like it's a validated piece of information. I just saw too. a thing this morning that the guy was saying uh, somebody described it as mansplaining. <laughs> and I was like, that's 100% what it is because it's like, I'm going to tell you this and I don't care if it's wrong and I don't care how much you know about the subject and I don't care about, I'm just going to tell it to you with all the confidence in the world. <laughs> AI-splaining. AI-splaining. Yes. So let's talk about what that looks like practically. When AI is explaining to us what isn't actually true, the biggest concern I've seen obviously comes from educators who have talked about their students, many of whom won't be able to pay that $42 a month price. But what they will do is pool their funds collectively and all use the same login, right? Kids are smart. Kids use Google Docs to communicate with each other in school because Docs are publicly available even though the Messenger software is not. But you can have whole chat threads in the comments on a Google Doc. Sorry, didn't mean to ruin it for anyone. Like kids are always going to find a way to get around this stuff when you are asking chat gpt or another ai to write term paper that presents some problems and we're i'm aware of a number of tools that have been created people are talking about ways to fact check papers I think there's some alternatives here, and I bet Mina agrees. What would, should we be doing with AI in our schools? Teaching kids how to fact check. Yes. Frankly, give it to them, see what they do with it, and then teach them how to do it better. That's it. Let's not try to force our kids to write papers if we have technology to do that for us. Let's teach them how to do the creative problem solving do the persistent problem solving, how to organize that information and data, how to come up with the right questions. I mean, let's teach them to be the freaking star trekkers that they're gonna be. Please don't sit my kid down and make them write a stupid paper. Teach them how to structure a paper, how to organize it and how to make sure it's true, how to run with the data. That's what I wanna see. And that's what they're going to be, have to learn how to do to work with this technology in future job fields. One of my- well, And there's a question here about what are we actually testing? Like when right, you have exactly. a kid write a paper, what are you actually testing? Are you grading them on how they write the paper or are you grading them on the, the knowledge that they're imparting? And I think too often you're grading them on how they structured the paper, right? Or it's not clear, or the teacher is not clear, but then you get points marked off because you didn't structure that paragraph correctly. So I think it's also gonna change the rubric and, and what we're asking, it's gonna have to. And I think that's a good thing because too often right now, the test is testing how well you take the test. It's not testing your knowledge, you know? And that's right. true. And as someone who was really good at essays, <laughs> Uh, it's still true. Like, you know, if you if you test somebody on how well they can craft an essay, but the essay doesn't say anything, is that still a good grade? 
right? <laughs> that does subvert the creative and interpersonal tools that are going to keep human beings from becoming obsolete in general. So we're actually teaching them against a, a, a good, a healthy future. Right. It's, I got a comment here about an analog clock, and it's such a good example. Kids don't need to learn how to read an analog clock. When are they going to be exposed to analog clocks on any frequency? It's, it's like learning calculus. Who needs it really in high school anymore? One of my favorite blogs, the Category Pirates, talks about the difference between native analogs and native digitals. And I think most of us are probably right around the cusp here. We probably grew up in the analog world, but acquired digital native skills because we all work online. The people who grew up this way, our children, are fundamentally different in terms of the way that they think about knowledge, the way they think about information gathering, the way that they think about details. So when I'm teaching my kid, cursive is on the list because his handwriting is terrible and it's a, f a fine motor skill. I'm not teaching it because I think that he needs to know it. I'm definitely not teaching him facts and regurgitation because he has Google and Wikipedia in the palm of his hand. What he needs to know is how to access that information in the palm of his hand and then use that information in different ways. I think we have to really talk about the impacts on education as we go forward because it's going to be more than it taking all of our jobs. What it does change is how we learn and process and that should not be hindered. If y'all had a magic wand that you could wave today and see a structural change what would ai make better i'll start with mina because i'm sure she's got a lot here so ultimately we have developed an entire social structure that is buoyed by an entire legal structure and supported by an entire socio mindset structure that punishes altruism, which is one of our natural traits that um, diminishes abundance and propagates consumption, even to the point of our own destruction and forces unnatural boundaries and separations between people and all of the aggressive violence that comes with that. So if I could wave a magic wand and produce an AI that continually points out, that could be scrolling with C-SPAN, right? And pointing out, you know, this buds from a talk given by this conquistador in 1200 that resulted in this much bloodshed and constantly give people information that can help us make decisions based on what we want based on um, what we, based on creating a social structure that is so incredibly stable that it can support infinite diversity in infinite combinations, that's a quote, that's what I would create. That's the AI that I would bring forth. It's magical, I love it. Brittany, what you got for us? Oh my goodness, how can anyone top what she just said? <laughs> <laughs> like, if you don't agree with her, you're a bonehead. This is like, from an ethical and moral standpoint, absolutely, we want to be able to, to give that because as we've uncovered during this entire chat, yes, it's an amazing tool. No, it cannot replace humans. I even asked it, Lacey, can you, are you going to take over the jobs of copywriters? And it was like, absolutely not. Here's why. Um, and then you know, understanding the nuances and the biases of everything, 
of course, if we all had a magic wand, would we not also choose what Nina had shared with us? I mean, I, I can't top it. So I'm just going to agree with her. <laughs> Lacey, before you pile on. No, I got a separate idea. I mean, I totally agree with what Mina good, said, one hundred and ten percent. And when that's done, we can't. <laughs> Actually, what what I got to think about is we were talking about education. Um, what I would love is an AI uh, driven thing that would help personalize education for each child. So, it, um, a, a software, an AI, a program, whatever it is, that will. Um, learn and grow with the kid and and figure out oh they didn't grasp that concept um you know i have a friend who just went into special education she just got her master's degree and she went into special education this year and it's fascinating i have a very mainstream neurotypical whatever that looks like kid um who was struggling with some math and so my friend said oh i have this assessment i can give her so we went over to her house and she did this assessment and she immediately pointed it out oh, your sixth grader sort of missed this chunk of understanding how numbers work together. And the second she said it and she was like, it, you know, it's involved in like guesstimating time, how long something will take and, and rounding numbers. And I was like, oh my God, that's exactly where she's struggling. Like she could tell within just a few minutes where Devin had missed a step somewhere, right? And it's not even a big step. And I said, why don't they do this? <laughs> like, why isn't her sixth grade math teacher doing this and she says nobody has time nobody has time to sit here and administer if if your kid is passing and getting b's and a's and whatever nobody's going to sit there and take the time to figure out that she missed this section so i believe there could be an ai that takes what we already know about how education works about how brains work about how whatever and could ask her a few questions and be like hey you need some more practice in this right it's it's that easy like it exists and i think it could only get better and better and better because i think one of the biggest drawbacks in our public education is that we're trying to fit everybody into this very narrow band and there's so many kids who do not fit it for any number of reasons so having some kind of education that would grow with them would be amazing uh, there's an argument to be made, especially in America, that we are training our children to be good capitalists and nothing else. But education is a war zone right now. Our kids go to school and do active shooter drills. They have to deal with tests that don't actually test their knowledge and only test their ability to take the test. The bare minimum we could give educators at this point in time was a kind of software that allowed them to know their students better and to teach each individual student. And I think the resistance here probably often comes from the time that would take, but I really think we have to readjust our views around time use when it comes to the AI, right? It's not going to take our jobs. It's going to save us time. We have to figure out the ways in which it saves us time so that we are building the right things. All right, Veronica, what you got for me? Okay, so after all of that, <laughs> the first thing that came to my mind, and maybe this is where my bias comes in, is because for me, like operations to me is like a, uh, an understanding and study of how people take action and how people thrive and how we make our solutions so effective is because we align it with how somebody naturally does well. So like if you're a list person, I would never make you think of your work in any other way. So it's like for me, how can AI make me be the best person I can be to understand who I am, where I want to go and to help me cultivate and live a life or do whatever that is according to my rules and not some prescribed thing that society says you're supposed to do, however that looks. And quickly going back to the bias thing, because I didn't even think about it until Brittany brought it up earlier about the whole swearing. So because Business Laid Bear is a very sex and kink positive brand, I started typing in things to 
chat GPT. And it's like, we suggest that you can't, you can't use this language because it will alienate potential clients and customers. It doesn't even say it could, it said it will. And I'm just like, okay, there's that bias right there. So I just wanted to let you all know, this is why. Right. Because that's specifically what you're are looking for. That's specifically the audience you are trying to cultivate. It's, it won't hurt your business. It only helps your business, but the buy it is implicit. Yes. So that's me. Make me the best person I can be and to live the best life I can. How do I use that as a tool to help me do that? Is there a danger in over gamifying your life? In Are you asking over me personally? Over optimizing. Yes, because this is your suggestion. Is there a danger in over optimizing? Yes, because then I strive for perfectionism, but also I have learned that competition and gamifying is also what drives me. And that could also, when done to an extreme, could be very unhealthy. So this is where AI needs to be really smart and not just like keep pushing me towards that edge and feeding me more of what I said I need, but not understanding where, where that edge is to, you know, basically use that safe word. Like so the done. bias here can't be towards productivity. And that's no. going to be really important. The metric that we most often use to optimize business and tools right now is productivity. It is what will make us more productive. How many more hours of work can I squeeze into my day? Which is why I think so many people feel so overwhelmed all the fucking time because what they're trying to be is more productive. I got, so I posted the schedule for my podcast yesterday and all of the shows that I am doing this week. This is just today's show. I have a show a day. That's what's coming up. And the feedback has overwhelmingly been, how the hell do you make all of this work? You are the most productive person I have ever known. And I'm like, I don't understand how you view productivity when I spent my entire morning in bed petting cats and playing video games. We have different views on productivity. This is absolutely an income generating activity for me because y'all share this with your network. It grows my network, right? This is, this is lead generation at its finest. So this hour and a half, two hours is absolutely a highly productive use of my time. And then the rest of the day, I'm going to be fucking around and screwing off and smoking pot because I've done my productive thing for the day. When we look at optimization, I think it's really important that we consider what we are optimizing for and where that bias is. So I'll come back to this. Jessica, do you have a magic wand that you would wave and fix us all with AI? I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to combine what everyone said. Fabulous. Um, okay. So starting with what Mina said, I want to tell you about my morning, Mina, because you actually, you, you literally said exactly what my waking conversation was with my uh, wonderful, I call him my AI advisor. He goes, what should I make with SageMaker, which is a machine generating um, tool. And I was like, man, I really don't know. I'm going to have to think about this and wake up a little bit more. And I thought about a character of mine. Her name is Seema Redline, and she is actually going to be the first AI president. And I said, hey, how about you make a tool that com combines all, <laughs> if not every single political bias, even we could even go as far as universal, um, not only the biases, but the data from all of the decisions that we could potentially make and make it so that it will help us analyze what the best decision would be. And he's like, evil laughter. Yes, let's do that. Um, and so um, what we, I want to talk about what we need to make all of what you guys said happen. Okay, the first thing we, we really need is people who are reluctant towards AI and technology to start feeling like they have a place in AI and technology. 
um, they need to be part of the construct that is where we are right now. Um, I think Westworld had it right. We are literally in the wild west of progress right now. That's why it was basically in the setting of Westworld is the wild west. And what we really need is educators to stop being left out of the conversation and to feel like their jobs are pivotal to progress. We need to stop leaving them out and making and turning our our heads away from what they need to care enough about our kids, their students, and not keep technology away from them. Um, I also feel that we need to utilize the time saved to leverage the type of change to move that needle toward universal progress. And finding that edge of optimization would be the goal, figuring out what is our limitation really, and how do we backpedal once we've gotten there? Do we need to backpedal once we've gotten there? And uh, yeah, all together, I think that's what we really need the most is participation and access for universal progress. When we're talking about reinventing, usually we do that with violence, y'all. I, I, I mean, historically speaking, if you're at all interested in this process, I deeply encourage Mike Duncan's podcast, Revolutions. There is a very clear history of tearing down the old and making the new with violence. I think there's a way to do it differently this time, here and now. But I think we have to have some real boundaries around what that looks like. How do we usher in a new era of progress without killing each other? We are so polarized right now. Everybody hates everyone. You are my mortal enemy if you do not agree with me on XYZ concept. And we do not have discussion anymore. We have screaming matches. So while I would like to see this conversation happen on a much larger scale, I don't think that we have the necessary frameworks in place in order to see that happen. What does it look like to you to have a larger conversation around this? Lacey, you look like you have thoughts. I'm gonna see this to Mina because she was raising her hand while you were talking. So I'm gonna let her go first and then I'll jump in. Okay. So that's what my project is. That's what the 2K Days project is. It is a six part framework that I have taken about 10,000 years of history, broken down multiple revolutions in, from all over the world to find that there are six steps to creating a system that can replace an old one. And now I'm helping people build companies that reproduce that progress where the, their vision is the product that they're selling, and that is subsisting. They're selling that is providing the subsistence to grow their system through that six stages of becoming a potential institutional alternative. That's my project, is testing this model over the, over the next 2,000 days, and then developing an institute to seed that. But here's the most important part of this. Historians do say that historically it's been violence that catalyzes revolution. And I'm telling you that's not true. It has been correlative, but it's not actually what has produced the revolution. It's the presence of a viable alternative, the popularized presence of a viable alternative. Wars were fought over capitalism multiple times. It wasn't until a merchant class gained enough control over a great enough expanse that they were able to educate and then raise their own armies. 
And the reason that they raised armies, taking the American Revolution as an example, the reason they raised armies was because they wanted to maintain disparity. And you'll see a significant um, difference between which side of the war people were on based on literacy where many people who remained illiterate sided with the old ways and many people who were literate managed their own households, their own plantations, their own people and raised armies from the people they employed. So if we, if we close that disparity gap, we erase the need for violence. So it is to really create nonviolent revolutions. It's popularizing an alternative, which is exactly what a business is, and closing disparity instead of filling that gap with blood. And that's what war really is. It's closing the gap of disparity between you and who you oppose by offing enough of their people. We're closing that through education and buy-in, literal buy-in with your dollar, with your volunteering, with your uh, advocating or whatever else. So that is exactly what my project is. We absolutely do have a framework for it. I'm more than happy to share that framework as loud, proud, and, and widespread as, as humanly or AI-ly uh, possible. And that is 2kdays.com, yes? 2kdaysproject.com. Please drop that in the link in the chat. Okay, Lacey. Yeah, so I mean, just to, just to jump on that, like what Mina's saying pr proves to be true today. Like, in American society, just as an example, we see that the people who are, <laughs> I'm trying really hard to figure out how to say this. Um, there are there are conservatives who choose not to send their children to college because it has been shown that when children go to college, even a conservative college, they become less conservative, right? Because their world is opened up to different ways of thinking, to different types of people, to different worldviews, right? And so there's this whole backlash happening right now against education because education is the enemy of this ideology that these people are pushing, right? Um, that is that is pushing us backwards <laughs> rather than forwards. To counterpoint so, that, just go because ahead. in a massive political scale, it is also the most liberal among us who are the most likely to be anti-vaccination. So again, totally. this yeah, is and so I, that's why I was trying to be really careful because I don't want to demonize one side or the right. other. We both have <laughs> everybody's <issues>. got it. <laughs> Everybody. Because you can you can make a big circle, right? You come all the way back around. Like I saw somebody talking about um, what is that thing that there's something that's infiltrated sort of the spiritual entrepreneurs network about 5D, 5D spirituality or whatever. And they're using this um, language that like when you start to ask questions or you start to, to question what they're saying, they're like, mm, well, you're just not, you're, you're too 3D for that. You're not 5D. You're not on my level. And it's, it actually just shuts you down. It's not like, here, let me educate you to get you on my level. It's like, um, mm, you just don't get it. You're just not on my level. And it's, it's like education is the, the antidote to a lot of these problems. I'm not going to generalize and say everything, but <laughs> everything practically, right? So the more we could use AI to support that, support the education of everybody. I mean, maybe there's a thing that's like you tweet something and they're like, actually, <laughs> maybe you'd like to read this link of a non-biased news source that could tell you how that's really wrong. I don't know, but, but there's got to be between AI and psychology, we could come back around to let's educate people so that we can change the world in a positive way without bloodshed. Brittany, education comes at a cost, right? Content yeah. overload is a real thing. We have so much content coming in all of the time. How do we help people differentiate without allowing the bias, right? Where is that line there? I feel like this is so difficult. And as we, you know, when we first started talking about this and talking about ChatGPT becoming paid, you know, as soon as you start paying for things, 
there's someone heading this. There's someone's agenda that's being pushed. And as we're having this conversation, you know, I'm having these thoughts myself of how do we even pull this off where we can create, I mean, within our own countries, but going even further and thinking globally, how do we create unbiased education? And is it even possible? I don't have an answer for that. Um, because you know, other countries are dealing with their own situations. We'll just kind of say that to put it extremely lightly. I think that as, as humans, we have to do our due diligence as best we can with the tools that we have. And, you know, as, as we've been having this conversation and talking about, you know, if we could teach our kids how to fact check look at what's going on in the world. How many people are looking at Facebook for all of the answers and then just believing it? And when we start putting different information behind paywalls, we're we're just solidifying that divide and creating more division and more problems in our world. And so, you know, as human beings, we have a duty is everyone going to take it seriously? Absolutely not. But as those of us that are, you know, trying to be moral and ethical, we absolutely have a duty to do our due diligence and try to see both sides of things and try to absorb and educate ourselves as much as humanly possible as we're navigating this new monster that we're being presented with. Mina, how do we prevent bias in a political way? So geopolitical structure implies that I, my beliefs are very much a foundation of where I live, who I come from, what my people are, and there are no universal facts, right? Even scientifically, what makes science great is the ability to go, mm, I don't know about that. Let's try something different and see if we get a different result. So how are we educating without also mandating? So education is awesome. Obviously, the more education you have, the more decisions you have, but ultimately people don't make decisions. They don't act out necessarily on their best interest. They're, they make decisions based on belonging and safety. And so if you look at the way that information is maintained and monitored and disseminated today versus Bacon's Rebellion, right? Um, I think Professor John A. Powell says that whiteness was really developed after Bacon's rebellion at the beginning of the uh, the birth of the United States. I thought originally that it was, you know, with suburbanism and, and moving out into um, bridging out urbanism and suburbanism. But if you look at the evolution of how ep information spreads, we went more uh, away from the whole locus and now it looks more like hives. So now we have the same kind of information being spread almost evenly with within any geopolitical or geo uh, populace within any demographic populace equally from both very well regulated sides. And the way that that's being maintained, it looks more like a hive. It looks more like hives now than it does as political or geological separations, which is really interesting when you start thinking about messaging density and how to influence action, right? But I would say that if you focus on having the education but on creating spaces where it's safe to explore the information, you're going to have a greater impact on actual behavior than, than maybe even decision making and helping people make decisions based on connection, safety and belonging, because it's difficult to belong someplace and then choose information over safety. Safety is something that comes up in my work a lot. And I think that it is because there is no such thing as safety. No one is safe anywhere at any time. And yes, 
there are clearly boundaries that we can place around the ideas of safety and what belonging and structure look like. And I'm going to talk to Veronica about this because this is actually a place that kink gets right. Not all the time, not in all communities, right? There are certainly places where it doesn't get it right, but what does it look like to have clear and structured guidelines around the perception of safety? Absolutely. So if we're tying this back to like AI, one of the things that we've begun talking to our clients about, because they are bringing things to us like, oh, so this whole chat GBT thing, how can I use it in my business? It's like, it's all about creating good boundaries, good communications around how we approach this thing. So whether it's something as well to me sexy as writing best practices or standard operating procedures as to what you can use AI for and what you can use AI not for ideally not for but you can try it it establishes a sense of security because when there are boundaries people do feel safe but again if those boundaries are put in in a malicious or biased way it's just to further somebody else's agenda like there is no one true way to do it but there's a one you way to do it. And when I say you, it means that every individual individual like hive or business needs to decide what is right and what is wrong. And there has to be inspiration for buy-in. So like Mina said, how can, how might we, cause that's what I was going back to in the design thesis of this is how might we inspire adoption of AI through inspiring people to care that this is to benefit them because there's always going to be the laggard. There's always going to be people who are reluctant and for good reason. Like that's why it's important to have everybody involved in the conversation. So it's always important to have a very transparent conversation around this so that you're not setting up unnecessary or hurtful boundaries that benefit no one, but the people or few perpetuating this. And I think that we are clearly talking about the future use cases. What does it look like to define those, Jessica? Okay. Um, there's a lot that I have to say regarding what everyone said about, you know, the previous question. Um, I think I might have to play a little bit of devil's advocate here only because I might not be as optimistic as you guys. Um, and there's a reason for that. I want you to imagine for a second that there are people who are having this exact conversation who are agreeing with everything we disagree with because it's true. It exists. Um, and I think as long as we have the polarization and the lack of faith that we have or that people like aside from ourselves might have in the world that we live in, and as long as education um, that is supplementing the right information, whatever the right information is, um, or even the wrong information, whatever is supplementing that information as a whole, there might not be enough safeguards in place to prevent all out bloodshed. Um, you know, right now, conservatives aren't using the tools that we're using and they're not having, they might not be having the conversations that we're having. But, you know, I've seen leftists go right. I've seen liberals take a turn. And it's just as likely that conservatives turn liberal if we're going to talk about it in that sort of sense. And it only takes so much time before they're using the same tools and having the same conversations that we're having in an adverse way. And it's only a matter of time before it becomes leveraged leaning towards destruction versus a proposed utopia. What we think is utopia is someone else's dystopia, right? Now, how we can define this or how this is defined is in the stories that we're telling, whether they're science fiction stories, movies, TV shows, like whatever it is. It is our way of experiencing the future without experiencing it directly. And it makes it less scary right? Because we're reading a story, we're watching something um, that has been filmed. It's a pre-recorded thing. We can't control it. We can't stop it. We can't 
really put our say in it unless we've created it. And I think as long as we continue to create, even the artists that feel like they're losing hope in their own art, as long as we keep creating art and as long as we keep creating avenues of conversation for everyday people, then we this conversation will definitely continue. And I think that's important. We're not looking to change anyone's minds by force here because that's not how it works. Mina knows no one changes their mind by force. So when we're talking about getting people to use this tool productively across the board, what we have to consider, I think, is ways to bring people in. What does it look like to invite people into this process who are not early adopters, who are late adopters, who are politically on every side of the spectrum? What is going to be necessary to get people to have this conversation in the first place? Mina? Um, so I base most of the models that I teach for information spreading based on the law of diffusion of innovation, which says that about 2% of the population is going to be providing the innovation. The next 10 to 15% is going to be your early adopters that want it just because it's there. You have your first 30% or so after that, that's going to be your crowd surfers. They're there because they want to be with the early adopters. Those are the cool kids. Your next 30% or so show up because now it's what's most available. And then you have 10 to 15% of the population for absolutely no reason whatsoever will absolutely never get on board. And so there's 10 to 15% of the population that will always be on the outside of whatever group they're in. And that's what we call diversity. It's fucking beautiful. Sorry. Um, the more stability we can create in our structures, the more freedom they have to exist. And by they, I mean me, I'm so fucking, gosh, sorry, sorry, second number two. Um, like hey, everything you're I here. <clears throat> thank you. Like I see in colors half the time, you can't understand what I'm saying because I'm speaking in the pictographs and things that I see in my head. So I'm outside of some circle too. When we're talking about um, helping people get comfortable with things, we're talking about understanding that we're spreading information we're using that almost hive base model, which is what we're seeing coming from um, mass power right now is that same hive base model, that same behavior training model of talk to your early adopters first, the ones that are closest to you, then they go out and spread the word into their communities and about the third wave that your, you know, uh, latent adopters or your, uh, what I'm trying to find a word here, your, unlikely adopters hear about it, it's the most successful, then they'll come on board and also have to be prepared and grateful that not everyone will, because it's going to be those perspectives. Like when this model becomes obsolete, you're going to have that first 10 to 15% that were your early adopters that are now clinging to it for dear life. And those guys over there are going to be the ones that are pushing the next innovation. We're connected. We are a cycle. We need all of these spaces. And that's how, you, but that is also how you create behavioral change or a good marketing plan. Or a good marketing plan. And it needs a marketing plan. Brittany, Lacey, what does it look like to sell this universally? Lacey, if you want to, you raised your eyebrows, girl. I want to know what you thought. <laughs> so... I totally agree with what Mina said. And there's so many different applications of this, right? So from a marketing perspective, chat GPT is like, if I were on their marketing team and they're like, we're going to charge $42 a month and it's going to be amazing. Um, the, the stories I would want to start telling would be why is it amazing, right? Because they're going to get those of us who are already in there playing for $42 a month. No problem. We're the early adopters, right? And then 
yes, we're going to go out and tell our people and Brittany's going to do awesome workshops about it and spread the word, right? But, and there's always going to be that next wave of people that aren't being reached or aren't quite there yet. And they're going to need to know the stories of why this is important to them, right? What is the pain point this is going to solve for them? So I imagine that as this expands, we're going to see a chat GPT rebranded in so many different ways on the GPT model or on the Dolly model or whatever it's going to be for different things. So there's going to be one that comes out that's branded by Martha Stewart that's going to plan all your meals. And then there's going to be one that comes out that's, I don't know, k12.org is going to come out with one that's going <laughs> to teach you how to how to do your homeschooling. And Jarvis is already an example of this because it's very much aimed at business owners and, and writing marketing materials and things like that, right? So And we should correct, it's Jasper because Jarvis sorry. interfered Jarvis is, you're with right. existing properties of somebody's right. AI and we can't use that name. <laughs> and But I think that proves my point here, right? Like we're right. going to have to be able to sell this to people in much the same way that Disney sells you the Avengers. It's just a fact. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's going to be uh, just many, many use cases, many, many different angles on the same thing. So I think to Jessica's point, there are people in other rooms having conversations about this that are thinking of completely different use cases from what we're thinking of. Maybe they're good, maybe they're benign, maybe they're not good, who knows? But all those use cases are gonna have a marketing angle. And I think the question becomes, what ultimately do we want from this? What we, we've talked about what AI can do, we've talked about where it potentially can lead us. Where we sit right now is, I think, on the threshold. It's gathering up all of the pieces that have already been in place. Uh, I have an article that I've talked about a bit. South Korea has been a pioneer in actual robots, in using the AI to create service industry bots. There are problems. Like, they're not as good as humans. And we're talking about service sector jobs, which should theoretically be fairly easy to replace. A machine should be able to spit you out your hamburger. But in fact, it's not quite working the way that they had hoped. Most of the AI and the robots have to have minders, right? There has to be somebody there telling it what to do. When we talk then about how this grows and changes and evolves, what would we like to see in the near future? not the utopian ideal. What can we give ourselves in the next three to five years from the existing tech that we have now? Veronica, let's start with you. Yeah, and I'll just go back to, because I think I just lean on such like a humanity perspective, like how can we leverage and inspire people to adopt AI in a way that makes the world a better place? I know that sounds like super cheesy, but it's just like everybody has different reasons. So like when you're looking at that bell curve of the early adopters versus the laggards, it's like everybody has a reason to want something like that iPhone. When the iPhone first came out, like I admittedly did not want one because I'm just like, why would I want that over a blackberry i do regret that now but you know it happened but it's also i don't know the blackberry keyboard man that was a special <laughs> thing <laughs> so it's like i think adoption and enhancement for me are what i'm looking for like how can it make me a better person? How can it make an organization do better? How can it make an educational institution do better? Whatever better looks like. So that is my wish because we can always do better. And like, if we're not evolving, we're stagnant. And that's, that to me scares me like flatlining in terms of not evolving or like bettering myself in some way, at least that personally 
is something that I try to avoid. Maybe there's like a baggage thing that I need to like unpack there, but yeah. How can we evolve for the better with AI? Brittany, three to five years. I, I kind of want to piggyback off of what Veronica was saying about being better because something that, you know, it, for me personally is, is so important is I was a stockbroker before I got into marketing and it was very much, you are there to serve your clients and people had my personal cell phone number. They would call me all hours of the day. I remember someone calling on Christmas morning because their son was in Mexico and he got stuck and there was a whole thing and they needed money and I needed to be available for those types of things. And now it feels like, and I cross my fingers, we're moving into a place in, in business and in, in working where we're starting to put life first again. And so to piggyback off of Veronica was saying about to be better and to, to do better and to have better thinking about how you can utilize these tools to create more space to actually have life. If we can streamline our day to day and delegate some of our dis uh, decisions, sorry, to a robot, you know, obviously not the important ones, but you know, these, these little things like, can you meal plan for me? So I don't have to, can you help me pick out some clothes? So I don't have to, can you help me find the fastest route from point A to point B, which yeah, okay. We got nav in our cars, whatever, but just these little things that we can utilize to give us back moments in time where we come from a generation, you know, we probably all of us here, our parents are probably boomers. Where it's like you hustle and you work and you put in hours and maybe someone will notice you and maybe they'll give you a promotion, but maybe they won't. But you have to keep just like nose to the grindstone and you don't stop. And yeah, lightening the cognitive load and, and reducing the time that we are spending on things that we absolutely just fucking hate doing. Can we make living better? Can we create more pockets of time to do the things that we want to do? When was the last time you went for a walk in the park or read a book or, or painted or did the things that we used to love doing? And you know, I've got kids, my heart's for moms. I never wanted to be one of those people that, you know, a daycare raised my kids and then we had supper and then they went to, to bed and I maybe saw them on the weekends if they didn't have sports. Can we make life as a whole better? And that's what I would love. And, you know, I, because it's something that I'm so passionate about and work towards, I'm always looking for that. So for me to go, Ooh, how can I streamline this more? And, and that's why we do things like meal, meal service and you order food in and do things like that. It's ease and it's creating more time for different things. And I think that that's where we're starting to move. So absolutely leaning on robots to make life a little bit better, a little bit happier, more joyous, more time freedom. That's what I want. <laughs> Jessica, how do we create more space in the next three to five years? Okay, so um, I'm kind of going to lean back on um, an answer that I gave earlier as far as the best way to have these conversations is through the avenues of creativity. Because stories and entertainment, they're basically avenues of access when we're talking about having conversations. Um, what do you do when you go to the movies? You wanna talk about the movie, right? What do you do when you read a good book? You wanna talk about that book. You want to share that experience with somebody and sometimes you're desperate to share it with somebody. Um, and I think um, as long as we have good stories, good movies, um, not just that, but good conversations, then those conversations will breed that access and will allow people to come into it. Um, in three to five years, actually, I think we should be expecting what we normally wouldn't or you know shouldn't be expecting within the next 20 to 30 years. Because think about what you said earlier, Briar. You said time is not just relative, right? It's been cut in half. The people who are using these tools, their time especially has been cut in half. We should be accelerating what we're considering um, as far as time is concerned, because that the acceleration of progress, the acceleration of technology is absolutely being leveraged by the amount of time we now have and the amount of access that we all have. Um, so ultimately, 
one of those tools obviously is going to be ChatGPT and helping people create those conversations and those avenues um, and preparing ourselves for the next three to five years, whatever might be within them. Yes, I think so. Lacey, what do you wanna see three to five years? I think this is going to be, my prediction is it's going to be another little sort of like tech bubble um, in a good way, I hope. Um, like what we saw in the early 2000s, where the internet became such a thing that there were all but there's all this entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial ideas springing up out of it. Um, the, the very best use case I've seen for chat beat GTP so far that gave me a real warm, fuzzy insight. I saw this on Twitter. Um, this man was, um, I guess he was coaching or advising a young man who had a landscaping business and the young man was functionally illiterate and it was really um, diminishing his ability to communicate with clients, right? Because they wanted to email for a quote or whatever and he was supposed to be able to communicate with them and couldn't. And so his coach wrote a, uh, an API, I guess, for chat GPT so that he could essentially type in what he could type, which is like, yes, coming Monday. And it would spit out a, dear Molly, thank you so much. Yes, I'll be there on Monday at 3 p.m., right? So that it became a different, and this was enabling this man to have a thriving landscaping business. I thought that, that's what we want to see. So I hope that in the next three to five years, we see that kind of innovation, um, people playing with it, finding the edges, figuring out amazing ideas that we can't even conceive of, of what it's capable of. And um, unfortunately, I think we'll also see the other side of that. So I think we'll see finding the dark edges of what it's capable of. And I hope that in so doing, we'll be smart enough to put boundaries around it or take steps against, you know, whatever that looks like. Like if it's if it's used for terrible things, if it's used for porn, if it's used for, th you know, things we can't even imagine it being used for, that we will as a society figure out, ooh, that is a line we do not want to cross and put some boundaries around it. But we're going to have to, like when you find the good edges, you got to find the bad edges too. So that's kind of what I predict. But I'm hoping it'll be like this amazing wave of like, look at all this cool shit we can do and help a lot of pe new people become entrepreneurs and, and, and find their way that way. Mina, this is 2000 days, like in the flesh. What are we doing? So I think this is a really, uh, I say beautiful as a researcher because we're watching it happen in real time, right? We're standing on an edge that they're going to be studying for centuries if we get our shit together. <laughs> Um, but what I would love to see happen with this little uh, childish period of exploration is for people to really start to conceptualize how valuable our privacy is and start thinking about privacy as a currency instead of things like the shit that we make up start thinking about boundaries like if somebody is using this to look up porn especially if they're looking up you know things that are hurting them as much as it's hurting the the image or the the victims let's just put it that way this is an opportunity to flash on the screen therapy near you you know what i mean this is an extraordinary extraordinary opportunity for us to figure out where our boundaries are as a society to promote greater liberty Right. I'm a, I'm an unparenting parent. My four year old feeds herself. She gets herself dressed. She looks weird and that's OK. But the boundaries are I know where her safety is. That's that's my job. And I think that as a society, we have now an opportunity to access so much information um, that we can create that kind of external stability. But it's going to require that we start thinking about new things as currency, for instance, privacy as currency start thinking about um instead of labor instead of consumption except instead of you know all of these various ways that we produce exploitation because that those kind of boundaries are going to become extremely important during periods like 2036 when we're expected to have our first permanent base on or in orbit of mars mm -hmm. Right, we're already exploring our Artemis One launched earlier this year. That's the survey 
launch for our first permanent outpost in orbit of the moon. We're doing that shit right now. Mm -hmm. So things like chat GPT and the conversations we're having about it and the demands we have around how we use it and how we contribute to it besides just currency are going to shape what that future looks like. We aren't talking about labor laws in orbiting factories. We're trying to reconcile our past. And I think keeping an eye to the future is always going to be one of the most important things that we can do. And as the early adopters, I think it is absolutely important that we pave the way forward. With that said, y'all, where can the beautiful people find you? Mina, we linked you already. It's 2kdaysproject.com. Is there any place else that you would like people to be able to locate you? I'm pretty accessible anywhere you want to be. If you Google Mini Mina Raver and just click on the link that you like. I love procrastinating, so get in my DMs. Whatever it takes to distract me, I'd appreciate it. Delightful. Thank you. Brittany, where can we find you? Oh, my goodness. I'm like, Nina, I'm everywhere. I mean, who isn't everywhere? My all the early adopters Facebook. here with all of the social platforms. The socials. All of the socials, all the search the social. engines, you name it, we're there. You can find me, Brittany Bud. And I have, like, Briar referenced and Lacey referenced. I have a chat masterclass that's free. If you want to check that out, BrittanyBud.com forward slash chat masterclass. Thanks, Briar. Thank you. Lacey? Yeah, I'm at LaceyBoggs.com, and that links to all my socials. I'm most active on Facebook and Instagram because, like we said at the beginning, I'm internet old. So that's where I <laughs> hang out. Um, but you can find me pretty much anywhere because I'm also an early adopter. If you want to talk about human-generated content, <laughs> that's what we still do. But if you also want to talk about... Uh, AI, uh, what, sh what should we say? Augmented human generated content. Um, I'm up for that as well. I like it. Augmented content. Go right. copyright that somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Veronica. And you can find me at www.businesslaidbear.com. And there are various links on my website on how you can Sign up for our newsletters because we send out just a tip, weekly tips for making your operations more orgasmic every hump day. And then my socials are in the website too. So would love to hang out with you. And now I have to update my opt-in for the 50 plus SOP ideas to add in some AI content, like SOPs and best practices around AI. So thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> Delighted to be of service today. Jessica, where can we find you? Hey, um, so you can spot my literary co um, collection over at jessicajacks.com. Otherwise, I am mostly like you find people, except I am probably am a little bit more shy. Um, <laughs> so I am always on Facebook kind of scrolling by um, and posting some of my soft core um, AI conversation <laughs> content on there, um, while also somewhat expanding on them on Medium. Um, those are the places that I'm frequenting right now, aside from private DMs and working in the shadows. Y'all, this has been fantastic. We're going to do it again. I had several people who could not make it today. I had several people who wanted to be here and could not. I think we are doing the work of having the conversations right now. Right. And that's the part that needs to happen before the great change comes. This is how we build things collectively instead of violently. I deeply encourage you all to check out my panelists, find them in the links and I have them. They should all be in the comments. They'll be in the show notes and we will absolutely do this again. Thank you all so much for being here. This has just been absolutely delightful. And I think we're on to something. It's going to get better, right? It. 
I feel like we are very much on the precipice of a great change and we have a choice what happens right now and in the future. And I think optimism is required. I think that believing that this is going to work well in our future is required. And being that voice of change is absolutely required. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching folks at home. And we will be back in two weeks with another episode of Voices of Neurodiversity. I don't know what it is yet. Much like this one, it will probably happen completely organically. I'll put a post up on Facebook and then people will want to talk about something. And that is what we are here for. We are here to have the hard conversations. Again, this has been amazing and we will see you all next time.